welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. Yeah, we had a nice session, a first session on multi-curve interest rate structures, focusing on collateralization. And we started maybe with a very you know, frightening observation. The whole interest rate theory that we did is wrong because what was here on the basis, our definition of a zero copper bond, our idealized product. So this assumption that everybody can trade in this zero copper bond, which is the guaranteed payment of one unit at a future point in time, that this assumption is wrong. So what we have in the market is that everybody issues different bonds. Yeah, If you would issue a zero copper bond, there would be different zero copper bond prices even if the bond has the same maturity because there is a difference in the issuer. So every issuer sees its own zero cover bond, PA and PB, you know, and they are different. But there is a scheme in the market that is to some extent healing this for interest rate derivatives and that is collateralization, originally created to mitigate, yeah, to reduce the counterparty risk so that you lose your money. Yeah, so you request some uh, collateral. Um, but the scheme will also introduce a special kind of valuation. So the value of a collateralized derivative differs, of course, from the value of an uncollateralized derivative. So the scheme for collateralization is that there is some cash flow in the future and we would like to request collateral today, so some amount C, that covers the loss of this, but also in the contract hidden, there is some interest rate that the collateral, if it is cash, so we consider here cash collateral, should accrue with a certain interest rate. Yeah? So there is some accrual, so there's some interest operating on the collateral account, so that the initial value of the collateral here is maybe lower, yeah, if the interest rate is positive, then the collateral we actually need there to match this claim X. Yeah? So there was the point that in the general case, this collateralization induces a valuation for collateralized derivatives. And the claim was that the value of the collateralized derivative is as if we would choose the collateral account. So this guy here is our collateral account as a numeria. Okay, so we have that a formula like in the universal valuation theorem holds where the collateral account is the numeria. And we really proved this. Okay, so to prove it, we just recalled what is the value of a financial derivative? The value of a financial derivative is the cost to perform risk neutral valuation using a self-financing replication portfolio. So self-financing means that there is only cost in the initial setup of the portfolio. After that, you do not need to put additional money into, you, know, you also are not taking additional money out from the portfolio. So the only cost is the setting setup, the initial setup. So the cost of the initial setup is the cost, the fair value of the financial derivative. So behind the universal valuation theorem is the ability to perform replication. And we were quickly going through these steps, proving that we can replicate this stochastic process, the value process for the collateralized derivative. Yeah, the steps were like you do it in the universal valuation theorem. 
you observe that the object that you have defined there is a martingale, and then you can use the martingale representation theorem to define your replication portfolio process. So I can define now the coefficients phi i by saying that I would like to represent this martingale by the traded assets I observe on the market divided by the numerators because they should, they should be martingales under the equivalent martingale measure. Yeah? So I assume I can move to an equivalent martingale measure, which has in the background some other assumptions like completeness of the market and so on to perform here this application of the martingale representation theorem. And then it remained to prove that this replication portfolio replicates my value process here of the collateralized derivative, which I have defined, yeah, which is my, my answer. So this replication portfolio means I have phi i units of the stock S i. And if I market, my market con uh, consists of N, my numeraire, and S1 to SM, you see there is still one portfolio process left. How many units of the numeraire do I have in my portfolio? And that is defined by the condition that my process is self-financing. Yeah, So the phi zero is just ensuring this property of being self-financing. So whatever you gain from the assets S, yeah, which are the risky assets, which are the ones that carry the DWs, whatever you gain, you put in the numeraire and whatever you need to buy additional ones to take from the numeraire. So this means that the reshuffling in sum is um, zero. Yeah? So that is actually here, this assumption that reshuffling Okay, if you multiply here with an n, yeah, you see that is the change of units in n, and this here is the change of units in s. Okay, so that should be zero. That is the self-financing condition. Yeah, then you just apply Ito's lemma for our replication portfolio, and it turns out that the replication portfolio indeed has some relation to our ansatz of the value process of the collateral derivatives. Well, I have that the change in value in my replication portfolio is the change in value in my derivative, but plus, okay, some additional term. So actually you see that we proved here that the portfolio is not replicating our collateralized derivative value process, yeah, our ansatz of. But we have missed something. The derivative is collateralized. So sitting on the side, there is the collateral account and we get interest on the collateral. And the nice observation is that this mismatch here is exactly the mismatch you see from borrowing or investing money in the numeraire and, and borrowing or investing money in the collateral account. And the mismatch is also here multiplied with a V capital C. So that is exactly what we have in the collateral account. In the collateral account, the, since the collateral account covers the value of my financial derivative, it pays interest exactly on this amount. So the change in the collateral account by the collateral interest rate is exactly R superscript C, the collateral rate times V superscript C, times, okay, the time period length. If you then divide by the numeraire, you see that you have exactly this term, RC minus R, VC divided by N, DT. That was on the previous slide, the mismatch. 
So we finally have that our replication portfolio together with the collateral account C, that replicates indeed our derivative value process. And that's the proof that this is the correct valuation formula. Okay, so that was the end of our last session. So a, a short remark before we continue. If you look at our valuation formula, okay, then you now have that V superscript C divided by N superscript C is a martingale. And that sounds now a little bit strange, yeah, because N superscript C is an account that accrues at the collateral rate that is not a traded asset. So the thing is that this is a martingale because the V superscript C comes only together with the collateral account. So it would be maybe more correct to always write the two objects together. But uh, for us, for the valuation, you know, it's just enough to consider the value process V superscript C. And it's uh, then that we just know that dividing this by the collateral numeraire, the collateral account, a yeah, cool account, um, is a martingale. That's a little bit like in the cross currency analog, yeah, where you have that a foreign currency product divided by a foreign currency numeraire is a martingale also for the domestic investor, because you can multiply on top the foreign currency product with an FX rate and on the bottom, the foreign currency numeraire with an FX rate to obtain a foreign currency product in domestic currency divided by a domestic currency numeraire. Actually, this analogy yeah, is um, really uh, holding here. A collateralized euro is like a different currency compared to an uncollateralized euro. With respect to speaking of traded assets, yeah, so maybe this here is not a traded asset divided by a traded asset, but if you speak of collateralized traded assets, then you have that a collateralized traded asset divided by the collateralizing numeraire is a martingale. Yeah, a short remark. Uh, legally, this collateral still uh, belongs to the other counterparty. Yeah, so if um, somebody is posting collateral to me and I have to pay the interest on the collateral, legally the collateral still belongs to the other counterparty. I have to give it back after the transaction, and I only can grab the collateral if something is happening. Yeah, like for example, um, the other counterparty goes bankrupt. There's a default, and I can only then take that amount of collateral that covers my losses. Yeah? So there are you know, some legal documents that specify this, uh, maybe some complicated stuff. An alternative would be to consider the, pro, um, the financial product settled in the sense that I consider that the collateral already, already belongs to me yeah? as you know, some cash amount that completely settles all future claims. This construction also exists in the market, is then called settled to market. But for us, that we consider now the valuation, uh, this is just um, a difference in the legal documentation, yeah, and it does not make a difference in our valuation theory. So now comes an interesting part. What happens if I collateralize an interest rate product, an interest rate derivative, especially for the strange case where the interest rate in the interest rate product is maybe different from the interest rate that is agreed in the collateral contract yeah? the interest rate that is used to accrue the collateral account. I already mentioned that the two counterparties could agree on any 
interest rate for collateralization. There are even in the market uh, collateral contracts that agree on zero interest rate for the collateral account. Okay, so my situation is that I assume the market quotes some interest rate I for the period from period start to period end. So this is my period TS to TE. And this depends on the time little t where I observe this index. So this index here is a spot rate. So the quote that we observe is for a spot rate. So it's just, for example, the interest rate that we observe for the next period. So consider some timeline here. So my little t is here. And maybe you observe now an interest rate for the next period. Uh, so maybe the period starts in two days. So I have a period start here in little t plus two business days. That's maybe a usual convention. And then it ends a little bit after, say, for example, after could be three months. Yeah. So this could be here a three months interest rate, the interest rate for the next three months. If you move to the future, yeah, so at a future point in time, say here, there's another T. Okay, there could be, of course, also another interest rate that we observe. Okay, so just the interest rate, say, for the next period, for the next three months. Okay, so this is not a forward rate. This is not a family of forward rate. This is a single stochastic process describing the interest rate that I observe. Could also be the short rate. So then, or the overnight rate, then the TS, the starting point is just the little t. And the TE, the end point, is just the starting point plus one business day. Yeah? So it could also be that we just observe it over one business day. It could also be a corresponding backward rate. Yeah? So we could also have the case where we observe here a backward rate. Okay, so that would be that I have here my time little t and my index i is now the rate that has accumulated over some period where the start is in the past. Yeah, so, you know, backward rate is something that accumulates, for example, every time here and we observe it. So there is some interest rate index. The example here on the top with the 3M, that is maybe some forward rate, the three months forward rate. Then you can consider a financial product that pays or exchanges this rate, like a swap. Yeah, A swap would exchange every three months the rate that it observes for the next three months. So I consider on a regular schedule, Yeah, that is our definition of, of a swap, on a regular schedule, pay the index I, here I receive it, yeah, it is plus, so receive the index I, pay maybe some constant S I in exchange, fixed in T I superscript F. Okay, there is some fixing time when we observe it. That was my little T on the previous slide. Pay it at some point, yeah, could be the period end for the backward rate, yeah, the fixing and the period, the payment time are the same. All these cases are here, yeah? So this is just a swap. So a swap where the floating rate is here, the I and the fixed coupons yeah, are the SI. In the single curve theory, if my rate I would be 
the forward rate, then I could express this forward rate in terms of zero Cooper bonds because there is a relation between the forward rate and the zero Cooper bonds and we could express it at evaluation time, little t, and I could value this future stream of payments by observing today's zero copper bond prices and observing the forward rates which are related to the zero copper bond prices. That was our single curve theory and our little theorem that describes how we value a swap that pays the forward rate. And you also know the lemma that a swap that pays the backward rate has the same valuation formula. So now I like to value this payment assuming collateralization. So I'm paying here some interest rates, but the whole financial product is collateralized. And I do not make the assumption that the interest rate that constitutes the accruing of the collateral has any relation to the interest rate that is here. Okay, so how can we do that? So if I do not know a relation between the two, actually there's nothing I can do. What I can do is I can maybe decompose the formula from our universal valuation theorem. So just applying here that we know this is how we value a collateralized derivative. I can maybe just decompose this expectation into parts that resemble what we had in the single curve theory. And this is here. So I can value now the collateralized payments as, okay, and this looks now very much like what we did for the swap. The sum of the values, because the sum of these, uh, so having multiple such payments, the value of having multiple such payments is just the sum of the individual values of the individual payments. So I have the sum. And then I define something that looks like a forward rate for the index i plus SI, what did I have? My, I had a minus here. Okay, there's a typo here. That should be a minus. Let's fix that. Okay, a minus. Multiplied with the period length. Okay, because here the payment is also multiplied with the period length. Multiplied with the zero copper bond that corresponds to the payment time. Okay, so and now I just define the blue and the green object. I just define the zero copper bond. So valuing paying a collateralized constant is by my little derivation, how I value a collateralized derivative, just the expectation of one divided by the collateral account at payment time, okay, yeah, because that is just one unit, take the conditional expectation, conditional to evaluation time, multiply with the numeraire, yeah, so the collateral account at evaluation time, that is my zero copper bond price, the pseudo zero copper bond or say some kind of synthetic zero copper bond on the collateral curve. And that I multiply with the constant that I pay. So, and how do I value now the payment of my index I here? Okay, if I would like to value this, okay, it's collateralized. So what I would do is I would take expectation of I, 
Well, it's collateralized, divided by my collateral account numerea. That one at payment time, okay, because this guy is paid at that time. Then take the conditional expectation to evaluation time and multiply with the collateral account numerea at evaluation time. So that would be the value of receiving I, fixed in TIF, paid in TI superscript P, collateralized you know, by my collateral account in C. Yeah, then I just define this guy to be exactly this. Well, you see, there is this guy multiplied with the zero Cooper bond. So I have to define that this guy multiplied with the zero Cooper bond. So the F multiplied with the zero Cooper bond should be this value. So if I divide by the zero copper bond price, then yeah, F divided by the zero copper bond price is exactly this valuation of paying the collateralized index I. So the F superscript C is the forward rate curve of the collateralized index I. You see from the previous slide, these are my payments to this slide. Actually, there is nothing um, behind this. Yeah? It is just that I apply my formula that tells me you can value a collateralized payment yeah, by dividing with the collateral account at the payment time yeah, and take the expectation and multiply with the collateral account at evaluation time. And then I just used that the expectation operator is linear. So it's just the decomposition into, say, smaller parts. But these parts now resemble what we had in the classical interest rate theory. Note also that there is here a superscript C on this forward. Well, the thing is that the valuation of paying the index collateralized depends on the collateralization. So the forward may be different for different collateralizations. And the good thing is that we already had a session on convexity adjustments. You know that paying some index, for example, some interest rate in an unnatural unit, this creates a convexity adju adjustment. So, for example, assume that this here is the unsecured interbank rate an interest rate which is related to the credibility of banks. Yeah? But then this interest rate here is maybe different from, say, a secured overnight rate that is used to build the collateral account. So these interest rates here could have some friction, yeah? so some mismatch. So a convexity adjustment is already maybe here inside. But now the funny thing is that my definition of this forward rate contains this convexity adjustment. Okay? So you could, like in the quantum adjustment, consider the convexity, the quantum adjusted rate, yeah, and you would get um, a linear product in this in this rate. Yeah, okay, so why is this useful? So the thing is that I do not have these quantities. Yeah? I do not observe a zero copper bond, a collateralized zero copper bond. Such an object does not exist. And I also maybe you know, do not observe all these forward rates here. Actually, some you can observe in some contracts. But what we observe now is we observe financial products that are collateralized and that pay these indices. 
So we can calibrate, we can calculate these curves from the financial products that we observe. We will observe maybe only some. So we have to use some kind of interpolation to construct these curves. But once we have these objects, we can then value all kinds of linear products using this valuation formula. Yeah, maybe still a bit unsatisfactory, but that is the scheme we have. We observe financial products on the market and we calibrate these curves. Yeah, I called these guys curves because it is a mapping for each maturity. I observe a zero copper bond and maybe for each fixing, I observe a corresponding forward rate. So I can calibrate now these curves. Maybe I only observe them at certain points. So we are here in little t, where we observe the financial products on the market. I observe the value of the financial products on the market. So I observe these quantities in little t. And I like to now infer these objects here from my observation. So maybe I observe only a few number of such financial products. For example, it could be that I observe a swap that ends here and another swap that ends here and another swap that ends here. So maybe I can calibrate the zero copper bond prices at different different times. Yeah? Okay, so here I have four different times. So maybe I need four products. Okay, I also observe maybe this guy here. Then we need some kind of model to interpolate the observed quantities. Yeah? So we have observed four quantities and we need some kind of model that interpolates the values. So that constructs the curve from the observed data. And given that I have then these curves, I can value all kind of financial product that pay this collateralized index I. So all products that pay here this I when it is collateralized with the collateral account and superscript C. Yeah, actually there's uh, another thing that is a bit puzzling. You see, you have two unknowns because you need to construct the zero copper bonds and you need to construct the forward rates. You have two unknowns. So for every financial product, actually you need two observations. And this little problem is healed by now the surprising fact that we can recover the whole single curve theory. Okay, so this is nice because I started with the shocking news that all the stuff you do, all the textbook interest rate theory is wrong. But now it is that if the collateralization is done consistently with the indices, then actually this is creating a single curve interest rate regime. So most collateralized products on the market that have cash collateralization, yeah, I will come to other ways of collateralization in a few slides. They use a standardized rate for the collateral rate. So the market 
uses a standard daily or overnight interest rate. A, superscript C, has the collateral rate. So examples are the Euro STR for Euro or the SOFA for US dollar. So maybe you can have a look at these links here below. Okay, so these are rates for Euro collateralized, Euro cash collateralized uh, products or US dollar cash collateralized products. So you see the Euro SDR, the Euro short term rate is a reference rate and you can also take a look. Yeah, it's published on every business day. So it's an overnight rate and the collateral account is then agreed to accrue. Yeah. Uh, so earn interest on a daily basis, business day basis, um, yeah, using that rate, which is published here. And the SOFA, you know, the secured overnight financing rate is actually the same guy in the US dollar world. Yeah, And these guys also are then replacements for um, forward rates like the London Interbank Offer Rate the LIBOR, if they are used to build um, backward rates. Okay, so assume that the market is agreeing on using a standard interest rate, a standard daily interest rate as the collateral rate. Then in addition, the market trades interest rate products like for example, swaps that pay the backward rate on the collateral account. So remember our session when we introduced the backward rate? So what was the backward rate? The backward rate is the performance rate of an account that accrues with a certain interest rate. So if our collateral account is N superscript C, then we look at N superscript C at time capital T, compare it to N superscript C at the starting point of our period. So there's a period from S to T. Yeah? So N superscript C of S. Okay, if the account is growing, I expect that this value is larger than one. Okay, then I have a positive backward rate. Okay, so I subtract my initial investment. So you can also say that this is N of T minus N of S divided by N of S. Yeah? So the relative value that we have gained. Okay, and then I'm annualizing it. So I divide it by time. Okay, so this is per year. So there's some day counting involved. And this is my backward rate, my backward rate I. I, well, for the period starting in S, observed at the end of the period in um, capital T. If you now use this index I in a swap, and the swap is collateralized with this collateral account, then the whole thing collapsed to a single curve theory. So what we do is we use the index I to be the backward rate obtained, obtained from our collateral account N superscript C. So what I had on the previous slide, the definition one divided by T minus S N of T divided by N of S minus one. So this is the index that I pay. And now my claim is that my forward rate, so the forward rate which we have defined on the previous slide, exactly fulfills this relation that we had for forward rates in the single curve theory to the zero Cooper bonds. So the claim is my forward rate is one divided by the period length the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period divided by the bond at the end of the period, which is exactly what we had for the single curve theory. 
Okay, so proof is very uh, simple, but just to see that you have to prove something, this object here is now what I have defined here. It is the value of paying this index when the whole payment is collateralized with this collateral account. Yeah? So I just plug in this definition. This proof is exactly like we did it um, before when we looked at uh, that the value of a backward rate evaluated at the beginning of the period agrees with the value of paying a forward rate evaluated at the beginning of the period. So F is defined as this expectation divided by the Co. Cooper bond. So maybe there should be a superscript C here. It is the Co. Cooper bond on the collateral curve. So if I multiply now my F, the object that we have defined there, if I multiply it with the zero copper bond on the collateral curve, curve on the collateral curve uh, corresponding to the payment in capital T, then this is just this expectation. It is just our universal valuation theorem for collateralized payoffs. Then you plug in the definition of I. So I pay here the index I, but I know the index I is a backward rate. So this means I have here on top N of T divided by N of S minus one. So N of T divided by N of S divided by N of T will give me a one divided by N of S. And the minus one with an n of t gives me a one divided by n of t. So you see, this is exactly the definition now of valuing a zero copper bond on the collateral curve. So this is now the object that we have defined here. Yeah, one divided by the collateral account numeraire at payment time. Okay, so these two guys here give me then the value of a zero copper bond on the collateral curve that pays in S minus the value of a zero copper bond on the collateral curve that pays in capital T. Okay, so it's the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period now divided by the bond at the end of the period, divided by the period length, gives me my forward rate F. Okay, so very, very easy proof. So now this is nice. If you have a setup where the market agrees to collateralize on with some daily rate you know, that constitutes the account N, and then on this market, you define interest rate swaps that pay the backward, backward rate. So that backward rate here on this account, then this is like in the single curve theory. Okay, You just have a single interest rate curve, the interest rate curve that describes the synthetic zero copper bonds on that collateral curve. And there are associated forward rates, which are then the expected value, the expected, so the value of paying the backward rate from that account. Yeah, that is nice because now the whole world is easy. And you see, I had this remark that we, when we observe here, yeah, when we now observe financial products here, 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 we have actually two unknowns for every observation, but now it's only one unknown, yeah, because there is a link between the observed zero copper bond prices and forward rates, and you can calibrate a single zero copper bond curve to these observed value. Yeah? You can calibrate a single curve because this here is just a dependent object that is calculated from the zero copper bond curve using this formula. So I can 
calculate the CO Cooper bond curve by observing collateralized swaps on the backward rate, where the backward rate is calculated from the collateral account. Then I have the CO Cooper bonds and I can observe other financial products that pay other indices, other interest rates or other, other objects. Yeah. And I can then extract the unknown collateralized forward for that index. Now you see all is now a little bit connected, but then you can step by step create these, uh, these informations. So then it's nice that um, we recover the single curve theory because now the world has become simple again. My next topic is that the world is actually becoming complex again. Uh, things are getting complicated. And yeah, this is also a small excursion because what I have here in this excursion is maybe also nice. I will show you that the put call parity, which we maybe know uh, also in the Black-Scholes formula, but it holds yeah, for general options, uh, this is violated. So the reason is that there are also other types of collateral. So in the previous section, we looked at cash collateral. Okay, I was providing you cash as a collateral and we agree that the cash should accumulate, accrue with a certain rate. So we agree on some collateral rate. However, another common practice is to provide alternative collateral. Yeah? So if I borrow money from you, yeah, I could give you maybe my laptop as a collateral. Uh, I could give you an asset. Yeah? So in case that you don't get the money back from me, you can keep my laptop, uh, my car, whatever, my bike, my love bike. Um, so a bank could give stocks or bonds as collateral. So there could be, for example, bond collateral or some assets. So we have an alternative setup where the collateral is provided in terms of assets. And yeah, what is now the theory? Yeah, I cannot agree on some interest for the asset, yeah, it, it doesn't grow that there will be two laptops after a certain while. So how is this working? If you have an asset, you can use this to collateralize borrowing money. And of course, if you use an asset to have a collateralized borrowing, that will change the interest you pay on the borrowed amount. Yeah? So if I borrow money from you without any security, yeah, there will be surely a different interest rate to be paid compared to that you get something as collateral. So if we provide an asset as, as collateral to borrow an amount, and now let's assume that we just borrow an amount that corresponds to the value of that assets. This will alter the interest we have to pay for borrowing M. And there is a standardized transaction uh, doing this. This is the repo, uh, the repurchased agreement or repurchase offer, the repo where I borrow money, but um, we, I pass some asset as a collateral for this borrowing, but we agree that I repurchase, so I get the asset back for a certain amount. And that amount is maybe higher. So we have two counterparties, A and B. Okay, and I pass you my asset. So you get S and I get M. But in the end, I get the asset back, but I pay you 
an interest rate on my M. Say so there is some time period. And this interest rate R, well, let's have a superscript R on top, is called the repo rate. So actually, this interest rate is there because I have collateralized the borrowing with the S. So every asset has an associated interest rate if S serves as collateral. So you can also have a look at the corresponding description here on the Wikipedia page of such a repurchase agreement. Yeah, so you see a similar picture here and yeah, the returned cash has accrued some interest. The transaction is a little bit more complicated than I have described it here because the value of the asset is usually required to be a bit higher than the amount that we borrow and this difference is called a haircut, but maybe let's uh, not, not consider this. So there is some interest rate, the repo rate associated with borrowing an amount M when the asset S is provided as the collateral. So this repo rate is surely higher if this asset S is riskier. Yeah, because then it's maybe not a good collateral. Yeah? So if there is some risk that S can lose value, yeah? so maybe it's not covering the losses in case that you need it. So this repo rate somehow also a little bit describes the riskiness, the credit quality of the asset itself. And maybe the best thing is cash collateral, yeah? but assets are also um, objects that can serve as collateral. So we have that this repo rate constitutes the corresponding collateral rate for that asset. So what happens if you have a repoable stock? So I have a stock S, but there is a repo rate associated with this. So this means that what I can do is I can finance buying the stock by a loan. So I borrow money to buy the stock. But since I have the stock, I can pass the stock as collateral to the person from which I have borrowed that money. So this means that a repoable stock can be financed at borrowing money at the rate R. So the stock can be bought, but then automatically collateralized with itself. Hence, to buy the stock, it doesn't require that I borrow money at a certain interest rate. It just requires that I borrow money at the repo rate. So like for a collateralized construction, like for a collateralized derivative, we have that the repo provides the financing at a certain interest rate. So it provides the numeraire, it provides then the interest rate R for that stock. So the corresponding collateral account for S is N superscript R that accrues at the repo rate. This means if I model now this repo able stock by an ETO process, I see that the drift is the repo rate. Okay, so you can think of that this stock is collateralized by a collateral account that accrues interest R. Okay, and how can I create this collateral account? I can just uh, create it by borrowing money and pass the stock as collateral, as a security to the person from which I borrowed this. 
Yeah, so this is like the asset is creating a little bit a self-collateralized market. Yeah, so where you have here the repo rate R for the asset S. The asset S is living here. And on the other hand, I have the market where my derivatives live, the derivatives that are collateralized by a collateral account in superscript C. So here everything accrues, everything is drifting with the collateral rate. Okay, of course, um, the size of the collateral account matches exactly. So you can you cannot um, borrow money at that collateral rate. Yeah, you always have to have the pair of the collateral account and the corresponding derivative. And it's the same here, where you have the pair of the asset S, and maybe now a corresponding borrowed money account. Yeah, in the same size yeah, coming from this repo transaction. So now we have a strange situation. Every asset could have its own interest rate. And what happens now if you have the situation that you would like to trade an option on a stock where the option is collateralized by the collateral rate a superscript C. Uh, so we have cash collateralization, cash collateral. We have our valuation formula that gives us the V superscript C. But my underlying stock, maybe I draw this guy blue. Okay. But my underlying stock, my index is a stock that has a repo rate A superscript R. So this means that I have, if I write down a model, I have the repo rate that gives me the drift of the stock. But I also have the financial derivative, which has from my pseudo universal valuation theorem with the collateral account numeraire, the drift that corresponds to the cash collateral rate. So how do I value now an option on such a stock? Yes, so you see, I have two interest rates being part of the game. And if I assume a black Schultz model, so that's just an assumption on the diffusion. Okay, that's not so relevant here. And I make the additional assumption that my collateral, my cash collateral rate, the collateralization of the option of the financial derivative and the repo rate, so the rate for the stock that is used in hatching, they are now deterministic. Yeah, So assume they are deterministic. So if they are deterministic, then I can immediately get rid of here these expectations. Okay, I find that now the Black Scholes formula contains two interest rates. And I can immediately apply our nice generalized Black Scholes formula that we had derived previously. If you go to that proof, yeah, you see all you needed was that you had a model for a stochastic process, our forward value, that is a martingale. Well, but S divided by the repo rate account is a martingale because S is drifting at the repo rate because I can borrow money at the repo rate. So this object here is then the value of the stock divided by a discount factor divided by a zero copper bond on the repo curve, and then I value this using my 
collateral account number there. So where my collateral account number there is just a zero copper bond on the cash collateral curve. So you can just go back to the derivation of the Black Scholes formula and plug this in, and you see that we get exactly this result. And in this situation, the put call parity no longer holds. And this is the situation you could find in the market. Before I show you the thing with the put call parity, another remark. There could be also another situation where the forward factor, so S divided by F, F is the forward, S is the spot value of the stock. So S divided by F, so this is here, S divided by F, yeah, so that guy goes here below, yeah. So actually this gives me then the zero copper bond on the repo curve in this setup. So the forward factor, in my previous notation, this would be the P superscript R for the given maturity. This differs from the discount factor. So the discount factor in the previous situation, it was then my zero copper bond on the collateral curve. So there could be another situation where these two differ. And this situation is the presence of dividends. Now, maybe to be precise, it is the, more the absence of dividends. So if you have, for example, a stock, yeah, like Apple stock or whatever, and that stock pays a dividend to the shareholder, then on the day when that dividend is paid, of course, the value of the stock decreases by exactly this dividend. Because before the payment of the dividend, a holder of the stock gets the dividend. After, the holder of the stock doesn't get it. Yeah? So the guy who had the stock before gets something. The guy who bought the stock after doesn't get something. Okay, so the value of this stock yeah, usually should actually drop exactly by the corresponding value of the dividend. So if you observe now stock values on the market, at the day when a dividend is paid, you would observe some kind of drop in value. Okay, this is then your stochastic process S of T. If now your option, if your financial derivative is just referencing S at a certain maturity, say here is the maturity of the option, of course, this drop should be reflected in the drift. Yeah? So your drift your expected drift is not going maybe like that. Yeah, it's going maybe a little bit below. Huh? So that should be reflected in the drift. So the drift will be something like R minus Q, where Q is some kind of interest rate associated with the dividend, yeah, the dividend um, rate. Okay, so that could be a similar um, situation. And for example, also indices that uh, reference stocks, some indices just reference the observed values of the stocks. So they are without dividends. An example is the Euro stock. This one is just the value of the observed stock at that time without the dividends. So Euro stocks has a more negative drift inside due to this removal of the dividends. And another example is the German Aktien Index DAX, which is reinvesting the dividends into the index yeah, in a, on a calculation basis, such that there is no drop. Let's check um, if this is really true. Um, what does it mean that this situation then changes or violates the put call parity? Well, if you have a call option, 
it means that I pay you the maximum of the stock minus K and zero. If I have a put, it means that I pay you maximum of K minus S and zero. So you get something when S is going below K. Here you get something when S is going above K. The difference of the two, so you see there's a minus here. The difference of the two is just S minus K. Yeah? So minus the maximum is the minimum is plus the minimum of minus the stuff inside. So you see it's maximum plus minimum of S minus K. So it's just S minus K. So I have that this corresponds to just paying S minus K. So there is a static replication of this. Paying S, the replication is just buy the stock today. And paying K is just borrow the amount K. So there is a static replication that gives me immediately the value. And this value agrees with the value of the stock today because I need to have the stock and the value of borrowing money, borrowing the amount K, which is the zero copper bond. So in the classical single curve theory, it should hold that a call minus a put is just the value of the stock today minus K times the zero copper bond, a forward contract on receiving the stock in capital T. But now if I go back to my generalized Black Schultz formula, if I now apply my put call parity to this formula, I see that I get the forward and the discount factor. But now the forward and the discount factor, they have inside different interest rate. So what we would get in general is that we have the call minus the put gives me F times M. So the forward times the discount factor minus K times M. Well, the K times M part, this looks nice. Okay, this looks like we had it here. Okay, so the M is the zero copper bond on the collateral curve. Okay, that looks nice. So this guy here is the zero copper bond on the collateral curve. But now the object here, this is S divided by the zero copper bond on the repo curve or the curve that has the interest rate minus the dividends. So that's drifting at the interest rate R. And you see these two guys here are not canceling. Okay, they are not canceling if we have different interest rates. If you have multiple puts and calls for the same maturity and different strikes, you can now estimate this forward and your discount factor by a linear regression. Okay, so linear regression is just, I take here as my model, a linear function, A plus B times K. Okay, could also be a polynomial, yeah? So the linear does not refer to this. It's just, um, could also be a plus C times K squared or whatever. Um, and I like to now minimize the distance of the difference of the put and the call from this linear function. Okay, because here it is a linear function in in K. Yeah? And then I can estimate the coefficient in front of the K, which is the B. And I can estimate the constant, which is the A. Okay, so I get my M is the minus B and my F is then the minus 
a divided by b. Okay, if I do a linear regression for different such options, I could estimate these two values. I have a small summary here, how a linear regression looks in general, yeah? for example, with a polynomial. So just for reference, we did linear regression in, in other sessions in numerical methods. Yeah, not so important here, but I have a small example that you can really observe this. Let's have a look at this example and then we are done with our session on collateralization. So what I have here is just um, a table of uh, different option prices. You observe all the guys are for the same maturity. It's one year, uh, but they have different strikes. Okay. And uh, I also have different types. You see for the small strikes, I have only here some calls, but then I also have puts, yeah, because the puts have a very small value um, for the small strikes, okay? So the puts are increasing if the strike is increasing. But yeah, for, for a certain region of strikes, I have pairs of such options, yeah? I observe a call price and I observe the corresponding put price. So what I do here is that I just define a range, a reasonable range, the spot value, the initial value of my stock. Actually, this is this is an index here, is 3,850 3, euro. So it's an index. So that is somewhere here in the middle. Okay. And um, I now observe for different strikes, the pairs. Okay, so this here function is just doing a lookup, yeah, a lookup when the word is call and the strike is this value. So I have your different lookups of these calls. Okay, so he will just check here for this key. Yeah, is it a call at that strike or is it a put? And I have another lookup here, which is looking up the put for the corresponding value. Yeah? So you can maybe check this. So I have here the put at 2,900, which is here, yeah, it's a 130, okay? So this guy is a 130. Um, so I have put and call. What I do here is I calculate the difference. And what I do here is I just plot now the graph on the x-axis is the strike, on the y-axis is the value of call minus put. So that should be my function f of zero times m zero minus k times m zero. So I can do a linear regression and I see the slope of this curve here is minus 1.0022. And the intercept here is, 3,755.3 euro. So that's, these are the two regression parameters A and B. My maturity is one. So now I can calculate uh, some values. First, the spot value is 3,850. Okay, that's also given from the market. What is my discount factor? So my discount factor is the minus B. It is 1.0022. It's larger than one because the interest rate is negative. Okay, so we have a negative interest rate here. So this is my collateral rate RC and it was in a period you know, in the past where, where the interest rate was negative. What is my forward? So my forward is here this intercept, okay, when the k is equal to zero, this intercept divided by the b, okay, divided by the by the m. So this is the blue guy divided by the red guy yeah, with a minus, okay, that is 3,747, okay. The forward factor, the s divided by the F is a 1.0275. 
and that's a minus 2.7%. So you see first the two interest rates do not agree. We have a different interest rate. And actually this rate is much lower. So the fact is that this is an index on stock values where the dividends is missing. So this is an example of this picture where you get some negative drift in, in the stock due to the fact that the dividends of this index here are removed. Yeah? So actually it's this example. Okay, so this guy is my rate A uh, superscript C and this guy is my rate A uh, superscript A. Uh, yeah? This case is not the case of a repo rate. Yeah? It's, it's actually the case that we have inside a dividend. Okay, so that was my session on collateralized interest rate derivatives. So you see there are some parts that now became nice again. Yeah? We get a single curve interest rate theory. If we have a collateralized interest rate derivative on a backward rate that is constructed from the collateral account, so everything is consistent, everything is nice, but you also saw that, okay, collateralization can come in different aspects and yeah, it can create complicated frictions in, in our models, in our formulas. My next session will be calibration of these curves. And I will also discuss a little bit the implementation So I also will study a little bit some interfaces and classes. And then we can look a little bit at code. How do we value a financial derivative using given curves? And the inverse problem, how do we calibrate these curves to observed values? This is standard in the interest uh, in the, in the industry, and also some parts are from a mathematical side quite easy. Yes, yeah? for example, it's a linear interpolation of some quantities and so on. But there are a few uh, subtle things related to our application. Um, for example, properties like locality that you do not like to have the value of a financial derivative with, with maturity T1 depend on, on observations of financial products that are beyond that maturity. Yeah? So T2 for T2 larger than T1. And these things come from the application and then they have also an impact on what you do on the numerical or mathematical side. For example, you think that a smooth interpolation method like splines is a nice idea, but actually splines are not a good idea for such a model. Let's do that in the next session. That was it for today. Thanks.